It's very fitting that the last formal presentation of our symposium is one by John Marchari, my partner in crime, if you will, in organizing this program. Uh, John is the Charles W. Engelhardt Curator and Head of the Department of Drawings and Prints at the Morgan Library, as if you didn't know. And he's a specialist in Italian and Spanish art of the 16th and 17th centuries. He's organized numerous critically acclaimed exhibitions on subjects ranging from Renaissance prints to German Expressionism. And he's published widely on draftsmen, including Veronese, Barocci, Francesco Vanni, on whom he organized an exhibition held at Yale in 2013. John received his PhD from Yale University and is a fellow of the American Academy in Rome. He was curator at the Yale University Art Gallery uh, from 2002 to 2008, and then for five years he served as curator of European art and head of provenance research at the San Diego Museum of Art. His comprehensive catalog of their Italian, Spanish, and French paintings before 1850 was published late last year. He arrived at the Morgan Library in the fall of 2014 and has many forthcoming projects there as well, uh, including the catalog of Italian Renaissance drawings of the Morgan's collection. This afternoon, John will talk to us about Janus Schultz, which is where we began today with Ian's comments this morning and his era. Please welcome John, our host. <laughs> Thank you, Inga. Thank you all for waiting patiently through the day. Um, I, I feel as though it's not a bad idea to begin by admitting that I never met Jana Schultz, and I'm very well aware and rather intimidated by the fact that there are many people in this room who knew him quite well, who studied with him, who took the famous seminars in his apartment. And yet, although I've been building up a store of personal stories about Janos from many people around New York, including his family, what I want to do today is to avoid those stories for the most part, and instead to look at him as a collector from a point of view that is more objective than personal. In other words, what I want to do is to treat him in the way that the other collectors in this symposium have been treated, that is, from an historical perspective. As all of you know, the Schultz drawings are now at the Morgan, but the story of the gift is a dramatic one worth retelling. In 1977, Schultz gave a concert performance at the Morgan, following which, to the complete surprise of nearly everyone in the room, he announced that his collection would come to the library. It was not given immediately, but groups of drawings came at regular intervals. You'll be able to follow the inventory numbers as I speak today. And at Schultz's death in 1993, the remainder was transferred. In total, there are about 1,500 Italian drawings, ranging in date from the mid-14th century up to about 1800. I'll start with a brief overview. Among the early drawings, there are a group of sheets from the Pisanello Circle. There are Florentine metal points. There are rarities, such as a sheet by Bartolomeo Vivarini. Some of the 16th century treasures are drawings like these, a Raphael study for the Vatican tapestries, the head by Savaldo, and uh, several sheets by Parmigianino. I'll show two or three others, I think. The collection is notably rich, though, also in artists from off the beaten path, people like Bernardino Campi, or Tanzio da Varallo, or Garofalo. The 16th century drawings have been the most exhibited and studied, but the Baroque drawings are equally strong, with good representations of sheets by Guercino, these are two of my personal favorites in the entire collection, so I work them into virtually every lecture I give. Um, also, collections by Mola, Bernini, and many others. The 18th century is also well covered, especially for Venice. And in addition to the drawings, the Morgan is also the repository for Schultz's correspondence, his index card records of the collection, and other archival materials. You see a history of exhibitions, opinions, and other information on these cards. There are few scholars of Italian drawing who are not somewhat familiar with the collection. Nevertheless, this symposium seemed the perfect opportunity to look at Schultz's collecting activities as a whole and to consider how he was, like or unlike other collectors, active in the middle decades of the 20th century. I, too, have a childhood photo. Schultz was born in Hungary in December 1903. His family was one of music and art lovers, and it was nearly inevitable that Janos, too, would become a musician. 
There had been cello players in four previous generations of his family, and Schultz became the fifth, starting music lessons at age seven and eventually developing into one of the world's most accomplished and famous cellists. You see him as a child here with his mother, sisters, and grandfather. In 1932, he joined the famous Roth Quartet, and when in 1933 the quartet came to play in America, the other three members, all Jewish, decided to stay rather than face the growing threat of fascism in Europe. Schultz remained as well and soon became an American citizen. The quartet disbanded in 1939, but Schultz thereafter had a long and immensely successful career as a soloist and chamber musician. Like Fritz Lucht, Schultz had been since boyhood a collector. But he often reminded people that he arrived in America with nothing other than a suitcase and his cello. As he toured with the quartet, he frequented bookstores and antique shops and started new collections. He built a large and significant collection of prints, which he eventually sold to the Philadelphia Museum in 1945. He would also form collections of books, of historic cello bows, of music manuscripts, and later in life of early photography. The latter collection is now in Notre Dame. A key moment in our story came, though, in 1935, when, on tour in Spain, he bought a large 16th century book of choral music. Forced to lug this heavy tome around Europe through the rest of the tour, Schultz began to think about collecting something more portable that he could acquire in his travels. Later that year, he bought his first drawing. He had success almost from the start. In 1937, yeah, it's not bad, is it? <laughs> in 1937, when in London, he stopped in at Spencer's and was surprised to find there what he recognized as a drawing by Piranesi. He took the sheet straight to the British Museum, just a couple of blocks away, and asked Popham, who we heard mentioned several times, why the museum people hadn't bought it. Well, Hugo explained yesterday that it was because the BM curators didn't get to buy things. Nonetheless, Popham and Schultz compared the drawing to the BM Piranesis and quickly decided that Schultz had found something special. It was also the beginning of a long friendship and correspondence between Schultz and Popham. And some of the most interesting and beautiful letters in the archive are those written by Popham, such as this one from 1948, discussing the drawing at Wright, which Schultz had bought from Hans Kamen the year before. A sheet like this makes one want to abandon email and put everything in print. I... Returning to the early purchases, though, at the lower left of the Piranesi drawing, we see Schultz's collector's stamp, unsurprisingly musical themed, with his initials beside a bass clef. The mark for those interested in such things is looked 2933B. Schultz had this stamp made soon after he began buying drawings. But only sheets bought in his earliest years of collecting have the mark on the recto, as here. He quickly changed to stamping the verso or the mount, and then apparently abandoned the stamp altogether in the early to mid-1940s. The Piranesi, spectacular though it is, wasn't an isolated discovery. Right from the start of his collecting, Schultz managed to acquire major drawings for relatively modest sums. The following year, again at Spencer's in London, he came across this drawing by Pietro da Cortona, now known to be a study for a ceiling in the Palazzo Mattei in Rome. He bought from New York dealers as well, and Schultz has been called the first major American collector to purchase largely in the US. But this is true only to a point. He did buy many drawings in the States, and in several publications, he recalled that, quote, Around 1935, it was easy to get a good John Battista Tiepolo on 57th Street for less than $100, while a John Domenico Puccinello sheet changed hands on 3rd Avenue for $35. This is obviously the sort of story that we find amazing today. The Puccinello that most recently changed hands at Sotheby's went for 970000 Ironically, Schultz never seems to have bought one of the $35 Puccinellos, but he did actually buy a number of Tiepolo drawings on 57th Street, specifically in the 1938 sale at Ferrargo Galleries of works from the collection of Dan Fellows Platt. 
Most of the Platt drawings are at Princeton, of course, but some were sold by his widow. And in fact, the stamp, the Platt stamp, DFP, was a posthumous stamp. It's a bit like Peter Lely all over again, with the widow stamping the, the drawings as a kind of mark of the quality of things that came from the collection. These two are among the dozen or so sheets that Schultz purchased at the Platt sale on 57th. By 1938, incidentally, Schultz was already stamping his drawings on the back, um, as you see here. Despite these 57th Street purchases, though, the Schultz collection ultimately included more Tiepolo drawings from dealers in Switzerland than it did from sources in America, and this is true more generally. There are as many drawings from European sources as from the States. Schultz noted, too, that his work as a musician opened doors so that he was able to reach some things before they could go to the market. One example was the huge collection of theater and architectural designs that had been formed by Michael Meyer, a 19th century Viennese sta stage designer. Hearing from musical acquaintances in Europe that much of the collection remained with Meyer's granddaughter and that she was in need of money, Schultz approached her and purchased hundreds of sheets, including big groups of drawings by the Bibiana family, and by stage designers such as Platzer and Meyer himself. Another large purchase was from the Brandigi collection in Boston, sheets that had been in the huge collection of Giovanni Piancastelli. Piancastelli had sold over 3,000 drawings from his collection to the Hewitt sisters in 1901 and thousands more to the Brandigis in 1905. From this latter group, the Cooper Union Museum acquired several thousand sheets in 1938, and that with the Hewitt collection is the group in the Cooper Hewitt Museum today. But in 1942, Schultz was able to buy what was left. This included many ornamental and architectural drawings like those today in the Cooper Hewitt. But it also included a great number of beautiful figure drawings, such as these, representative examples by Muziano and Lanfranco. Another case of music opening doors came when Schultz was on tour in St. Louis in 1945, where he acquired part of the collection of Dr. Max Goldstein, presumably preempting the sale of those drawings in New York later that year. The Goldstein purchase included some of the most famous sheets in the collection, drawings by Parm Giannino and the great Tadeo Zucchero in what I was going to call a Vizari mount until a talk earlier today. <laughs> now we'll recognize as being one of Gotti's mounts. It was also in St. Louis that, Gold, that Schultz bought his fa fantastic group of caricatures by Getze. He was particularly fond of the caricature of the Abbe playing a cello, of course. I've been showing mainly Italian drawings up to this point, but until this time, Schultz was collecting all schools. His purchase from the Goldstein collection, for example, also had works by artists as diverse as Rubens and Flaxman. Around 1950, however, however, Schultz narrowed his focus. In his own words, he said, quote, the break came when there was so much material amassed that I just didn't know where to go. I couldn't handle it. This is when I made the decision to collect nothing but drawings of the Italian painters. Things outside the new limits of the collection were sold or given away. The Meyer collection of stage and architectural drawings and many of the stage designs acquired from the Brandages went to the stage designer Donald Onslager in 1952, although these are also now at the Morgan for Onslager's entire collection came to the library as well. Another large group of ex Pian Castelli Brandigi ornamental drawings went to the Met, and the Met received as gifts some of Schultz's best drawings by non-Italian artists, notably these early sheets by Rubens and Rembrandt. Other drawings, such as this sheet by Ribera, also from the Pian Castelli Brandigi collection, were sold, although this one too wound up at the Met within a few years. Schultz can't be compared with collectors like Marriott or Tessin, who acquired thousands of drawings in the Crozat sale, but he did buy in bulk when the opportunity presented itself. A notable example is the group of northern Italian drawings that had been in the Moscardo family in Verona in the 17th century. These drawings had remained with the family, but came to the market in several large chunks. One group was bought by Luigi Grassi in 1905 and sold in the following decade or two. There are examples from this set in the Albertina, the Lucht Collection, and the Lehman Collection. We've seen a number of these drawings in the talks by Hare and by Evelyn yesterday with the big Luigi Grassi mark, um, northern Italian drawings um, from the Moscardo group. 
Schultz's purchases from this collection came, though, with a second group that emerged in 1949. He bought more than 100 sheets, among them drawings by artists such as Maganza, there are at least a dozen, and Latanzio Gambara. This splendid, large sheet by Gambara is an important piece of evidence here. For it, and it alone among the 112 drawings in the group, is mentioned in a letter as having been with the antiquarian Mario Uzzielli. He must have been the, so far as I'm aware, otherwise unnamed antiquarian who had access to the Moscardo heirs and was the key to the collection. The Badile album, about which Evelyn Carrot spoke yesterday, was also from this source. Schultz claimed to have seen the album in 1949 before it was acquired and broken up by Francis Matisse in 1954. But it was only later that Schultz bought two drawings from the album, including this sheet by Marco Zoppo that we've already seen. Other on block purchases included a large group of drawings from a collection identified by Schultz as the Savoia Aosta, and today commonly called the Abrate album, following Antonella Chiodo's recent work on its reconstruction. This was a collection put together around 1635 for the House of Savoy, which in the early 20th century was owned by the collector Antonio Abrate. In the 1940s, it too wound up with Francis Matisse, who also split it up for sale. Schultz was the biggest buyer. The Lanino at left is one of numerous drawings by artists from Piedmont and Lombardy, as might be expected for a collection formed in Turin. The Giulio Romano, however, was also identified by Schultz as a drawing from Piedmont until his frequent correspondent, Philip Pouncey, in 1958 recognized it as a typical Giulio. Another large purchase was a group of Bolognese drawings that had been part of a portfolio of 384 drawings acquired in 1908 by the Albertina, but then sold with other things declared the property of Archduke Friedrich of Habsburg after World War I. This too was an album split up. Parts wound up in Berlin, but much made its way to the US, and Schultz bought not only many drawings, the study by Rainey is perhaps the best of them, but also the title page. He was interested in the history of collections, like his friend and contemporary Fritz Lucht. Even as the collection grew, it was necessary to refine it and to some extent to refinance it through trades and sales of lesser sheets. In some cases, it was a matter of removing dubious material. For example, in 1948, in Milan, Schultz bought a group of characters supposedly by Getze. But when he learned from Lucht and Jim Byam Shaw that these sheets were of dubious authenticity, he sold them. The one it left wound up in Minneapolis, where it fooled Tony Clark, Minneapolis is also the home today of that Amico di Donato Cretti drawing seen at right. In 1952, Schultz bought in Switzerland a large group of drawings that were once in the saint Safran collection. In describing the group, he mentions that there were about 150 drawings by Donato Cretti available, but there are only eight or 10 of these at the Morgan. I suspect that the other Cretti and Cretti school drawings um, sold at the Slatkin Gallery in the mid-1950s and said to have been from Schultz were extras from the San Safran purchase, unnecessary to the collection, but useful if sold to finance further acquisitions. It's a pattern very much like that which Harris just described for Fritz Lucht. It should be little surprise then, therefore, that drawings with the Schultz provenance appear at auctions. Perhaps most recently, this sheet, which has Schultz's stamp on the verso, appeared at Christie's in January. In some cases, the Morgan has inventory cards for things eliminated from the collection, sold, traded, or given away as gifts. Here are three examples. A Guercino that was then deemed rather an 18th century imitation and eliminated in 1959. <laughs> the middle card is for a Checo Bravo an angel given to Helen Seiferheld as a Christmas gift in 1962. It emerged on the market again a few years ago, 2012. And then at lower right, a Francesco Guardi. I have no idea which Guardi this is. I haven't been able to locate that. But he says that it was traded for two drawings, a Giovanni David and a, and a Zucchi that you see here at lower left. But not only minor drawings were sold. Those following my credit lines carefully will have noted that the great Pietro da Cortona, one of the early prize acquisitions, was actually sold to the Morgan a few years before the gift of the rest of the collection was announced. 
I'd like to turn now from the formation and the refinement of the collection to its organization, for it's there that it had as much of its influence, not merely through its contents, but through the way Schultz organized and exhibited it. It should already be clear that he was concerned with more than simple aesthetics. In fact, what he ultimately formed was not merely a collection of prize drawings, but rather what he identified as a study collection with representative examples of drawings by as many of the Italian painters as possible, kept in boxes and organized by regional schools. These two photographs, obviously taken some decades apart, highlight that evolution. In the earlier drawing, in the earlier photo, drawings are framed and hung on the wall. In the later, Schultz pulls them from a cylinder box. He would have been well aware of the significance. To elaborate this point, Schultz explained that Fritz Lucht, whom he came to know very well during Lucht's years in America in particular, Lucht encouraged Schultz to focus on beauty and quality in his purchases. But Schultz said he could only heed that lesson to a point and admitted that, quote, my professional training left in me a mania for system and order, which on occasion forced me to lower my standards, usually for historical considerations. For the same reason, I decided to build a study collection of drawings rather than a smaller, selective collection with only handsome pieces to delight the eye alone. His drawings weren't merely decoration or diversion for the eye, as they are perhaps in that upper photo, but rather the matter of serious study. This isn't to say that there weren't framed drawings on the walls, but there was an increasing seriousness to the collection. Late in life, in an interview in Connoisseur Magazine 1989, I can't resist showing this photo that illustrated the article, he made the point even clearer, declaring that, quote, I am a systematic old bastard. My collection is a study collection, not a star collection. In this country, there are always these so-called big collections of the great masters and nothing of the in-betweens, the steps which led up to them, the influence of their masters, the influence they had on their students. Such an emphasis was hardly Schultz's invention. He credited his friend and frequent correspondent, Bernard Dagenhart, for impressing upon him the idea that a distinct graphology of regional schools could be, could be studied. The idea being that one could recognize drawing styles like handwriting and that regional styles were akin to regional spoken dialects. But Dagenhart was one of many scholars of the time who focused on such distinctions. One can cite Berenson's lists of the painters from one and another city as another manifestation of the phenomenon, and Hans Tietze, yet another friend and correspondent, was also, at a key moment in Schultz's collecting, working on his drawings of the Venetian painters. It's also this same idea that led to Luke's collection of the artist's letters and the study of the handwriting of the artists. Given this approach, Schultz did not hesitate to buy good but anonymous drawings, for he felt that they could be cataloged by school and eventually, with their placement and date narrowed down, linked to the work of specific artists. His correspondence is full of such discussions with experts like Tietze, Popham, Pouncey, Byam Shaw, and many, many others. The study of this beautiful drapery study, which Schultz bought in 1939 in Paris, gives a good sense of the intellectual tenor of the collector in his collection. It was acquired as Northern Italian, and it had been called Brescian School, and was variously attributed to Moroni or Savaldo. In 1956, Creighton Gilbert recognized it as a study for Catena's Annunciation in Carpi, which you see at lower right, and Creighton wrote, one of, wrote Schultz one of his typically long, carefully argued letters. I uh, was Creighton's student, and reading this letter brings him palpably back to life, not only because of the aggressive positivism of his discussion, but also because 40 years later he was writing on the same typewriter with the same ribbon still in it. Um, in any case, the discussion, which I'm not going to read in, at length, um, in this and several following letters makes clear that for Schultz and Gilbert and their closest colleagues, a single drawing could lead to greater understanding not only of an artist, but of an entire school, and even to the resolution of historical graphical, historiographical questions. Gilbert goes on about how this drawing being reattributed from the Brescian school to Catena, a Venetian artist, says that the whole paradigm of making distinctions between Brescia and Venice in this generation was a kind of false historical construct. It's an attack on Longi. Anyway, I'll, I'll skip that discussion. 
It was following this same line of thought, though, that the Schultz drawings were exhibited in shows focusing on one or another region. Drawings from Lombardy in 1956, Venetian drawings in 1957 at the Cheney Foundation, Bolognese drawings in 57 in America, Venetian drawings again in 1959, Neapolitan drawings in the shadow of Vesuvius, you see there in 1969, and so forth. And bigger exhibitions, such as the 1973 show at the Morgan and the National Gallery of Art, were still organized, grouped by works, uh, still organized with groupings of works by city and school. And this is a lasting legacy. Even as we today prepare a catalog of the Italian Renaissance drawings at the Morgan, we've structured the book as a series of chapters organized by region. And this was not done deliberately to emulate the organization of the old Schultz boxes, but it does, I think, reflect the influence of the Schultz catalogs on a generation of scholars. To organize a catalog by the name of the artist or by chronology alone is essentially to treat every drawing in isolation. But to group things by school creates a narrative that extends from drawing to drawing, from drawings to paintings, and from works of art to a bigger intellectual milieu. If the Schultz collection can be considered a reflection of broad trends in scholarship in Italian art in the mid-20th century, it was still an outlier in the pattern of its formation. Earlier American collections were largely accumulations of available material rather than curated selections. I've mentioned the Hewitts and the Brandages, who bought Pian Castelli drawings by the bushel full. And the same might be said, for the most part, of the Gurley collection at the Art Institute, or the 800 drawings that Cornelius Vanderbilt gave to the Met in 1880. There were great works among the large sets, to be sure, but there was little scientific or scholarly approach. And indeed, when in 1947, Hans Tietze wrote his European Master Drawings in the United States, he was pretty negative about the state of American drawing cabinets, seeing the Fairfax Murray collection at the Morgan as the only example of a well-chosen group of great drawings rather than a mere accumulation. Tietze's view was a bit overstated, for everything was changing by the middle of the 20th century. World wars, economic depression, and other factors accelerated the breakup of old aristocratic holdings, and the developing field of art history the increasing knowledge of drawing made possible through photographic surveys and other factors all fueled new collections. In Europe, one can think in this generation of Robert Witt or Franz Koenigs or Fritz Lucht. But even among the Americans, in the generation of people just even a little bit slightly older than Schultz, one could cite Charles Lozer, Greville Winthrop, Dan Fellows Platt, Frank Mather, and Robert Lehman. We also need to remember the extraordinary influence of Paul Sachs at Harvard, who instilled new ideas in training a generation of curators. My predecessor at the Morgan, Felice Stampfel, is there at Upper Right. I'm told that Agnes and Elizabeth Mongan, Bill Lieberman, and others are in this photograph taken in 1944. For some, though, attitude towards collecting had not yet evolved. Around the same time that this photograph was taken, W.G. Constable dismissed Dan Fellows Platt as yet another accumulator collector rather than a great connoisseur. Schultz, in contrast, would afterwards describe the Platt Mather collection at Princeton as one of the few thoroughly effective study collections in the United States. Moreover, like Sachs, Schultz taught notable classes on drawings and connoisseurship using his own collection, such as Ian mentioned this morning. Still, not everyone followed Schultz's path. Robert Lehman, Ian Woodner, and even Schultz's good friend Eugene Thaw still stuck to the model of buying great works, often the largest and most finished drawings, by the great masters. At the beginning of this talk, I said that I was going to refrain from personal stories, but I can't resist just one, from Gene Thaw, who explained to me over lunch one day that as much as he admired Janos and learned from him, he simply couldn't share, share Schultz's enthusiasm for the sketch by some Jacopo da Ferrucine for a figure in the lower left corner of some obscure painting. The Thaw collection, for all of its undisputed greatness, encompasses about 500 sheets from the early Renaissance through the 20th century, from every region of Europe and even from the United States. It's an entirely different proposition from the Schultz gift. The only thing even vaguely comparable to the Schultz study collection was the massive group of British drawings put together by Paul Mellon, 
who collected 20,000 British drawings in only a few decades. Mellon, of course, was coming at the matter from a rather different economic point of view. He's a bit more like the Duke of Devonshire than Janus Schultz. Moreover, long before he presented his collection to Yale, Paul Mellon already had a team of curators working for him. Schultz built his collection largely alone. Hugo discussed yesterday how this selected collection, this curated, refined collection, was a sort of phenomenon of the late 19th century. But Schultz was much more, I think, like his, what was the term, his great-grandfather Mariette, as Lucht called him, much more interested in a history of art and a study of art as told through the drawings. The title of my talk today is Janos Schultz and his Era, and I do believe that his collecting activity, which occurred, occurred mainly between the 1930s and the 1970s, marks the beginning and end of an age. When the Schultz gift came to the Morgan, Charles Reiskamp described it as a document of past market conditions, words that seem even more true today. Considering the question of supply alone, one wonders whether it would even be possible to acquire 1,500 representative sheets of a single school. You think about the difference in scale between something like Schultz's collecting of Italian drawings or the modern collections of Dutch drawings by George Abram or Chips Moore. Moreover, along with diminished supply comes the question of demand, and we've seen things change radically since the middle of the 20th century. Schultz never really bought at the uppermost reaches of the market, but the prices paid by Ian Woodner and the Getty at the great Chatsworth sales seem to have changed entirely the economics of the drawings world. Finally, this idea of a study collection is increasingly out of fashion, not only for private collectors, but even at museums. How often as curators do we hear from directors and trustees that we need to buy only the greatest things? Now, this is not to say that an institution should not be ambitious in its purchases, but for those few places that have a resource like the Schultz gift, we shouldn't rule out the great drawing by the obscure artist or the anonymous but compelling sheet. If private collections and donor-driven acquisition funds at museums overemphasize the fancy, finished pictorial drawing by the big name, then perhaps we should, at a place like the Morgan, use some of our endowment funds to develop further the richness of our study collection. In closing, we have to admit that, yes, perhaps the era of collecting embodied by Schultz has ended. It cannot, however, be overemphasized how much we continue to reap the benefit of his collection or the value of its having been preserved intact. Our, standing, our understanding of Italian art and of draftsmanship is all the greater for it. Thank you. <laughs>